Introducing the newest and most requested course from Foundry Academy, Intro to Hashboard Diagnosis and Repair, offered by the same experts who provide top technical training for mining technicians in the U.S. This essential academy course offered by Foundry will take place in Rochester, New York from June 26th through the 30th, 2023. With a strong focus on mastering micro-soldering basics, Foundry's dedicated instructors possess years of ASIC hardware experience and will guide you through each step of the process. They'll ensure that you gain the confidence and skills required to undertake basic repair jobs and keep your operation healthy and hashing. Register today at foundryacademy.com. Welcome back to the Mining Pod. We got your news roundup for this week, as always, joined by my friend Matt Kimmel. But not always, always, because he's not always here. But today he is. It's nice. Always starting with a jab. A quick jab to start it off. Okay, we're recording this Friday, about noon, mountain time. And should be pretty good for, for news. I hope nothing sneaks by us in the next eight hours before this is published. Uh, today we're going to be talking about ordinals, all the transaction fee mania that's been happening on chain. Just give a good succinct summary of BRC20s, hash price increases, and all that, including the ordinals drama from earlier this week. Then we'll go over and talk about Marathon Digital, which has received a new subpoena from the SEC relating to some filings of securities. It's a little ambiguous at the moment what the probe is about. And lastly, finish up talking about HUT8 and its production problems in zero sync, a new way to check the chain. Okay, Matt, give us a lay of the land on ordinals. What's going on this week? So I guess for like refresher, like what are ordinals, right? Ordinals is just kind of like an accounting standard of looking at Bitcoin, right? There's no, um, there's been no changes to, to Bitcoin that relate to this. It's kind of like you're running outside software and you're just looking at the chain a little bit. Um, and the way you look at that is by numbering, um, Bitcoin supply from zero, um, to 21 million. And it's actually the smallest denomination of Bitcoin. So like one sat right to the eighth decimal place, but it's actually one to, I think it's my math is right. Like 2.1 quadrillion, something like that. <clears throat> and the idea is that if you do that, you have an idea of, um, a certain code for each unit then there's a, they're kind of by nature non-fungible and you can identify them. Um, and so the whole ordinals thing, what people were doing, where they were inscribing these sats, um, they're using some pretty sophisticated methods um, and embedding them with different files. Um, and so the start of the wave of what are called inscriptions on Bitcoin, which um, have some, I guess, competition with the NFT space on other platforms where you can have like a JPEG attached to essentially a token, which in this sense is a touchy. Um, okay. So that's like the background, right? And then what happened lately is people doing kind of what, um, the old Opturn protocols used to do where instead of just having kind of an NFT, kind of like a persistent JPEG attached to, um, a specific Satoshi, they were attaching kind of fungible tokens you're issuing an asset um think of like a stable coin or like a meme coin or something like that um and this was how like tether kind of first originated on bitcoin and so uh they, the standard came out called brc20 kind of a nod to um the erc20 standard on ethereum that is how uh, assets get issued there and so let's see instead of embedding like a jpeg file type to a satoshi they would um, embed like a JSON, right? Like a, a certain text that was structured in the same way each time. So you could basically trace and see these assets, uh, whether it be a mint or a transfer, et cetera. Um, if you're a programmer, it's just a dictionary, right? A, a JSON. Um, and so what's happened is people are basically minting a bunch of assets. Um, and I guess like if the question is, is this little deal no deal big deal i would simply say it's not no deal um because some historical events uh for bitcoin has happened within that last week um largely due to this kind of craze uh whether it's short term or not and let me consult my notes here with a couple things so the largest amount of transactions ever settled in a day happened on uh the 12th 
about 600,000 transactions in a day. The average transactions kind of settle on Bitcoin daily is somewhere 250, 300 sort of thousand. So a ton of transactions. And that's because like blocks are full. Um, there's a lot of demand for transaction activity. Um, but also because of how much fees people are paying to um, have their transactions settled, right? Uh, it brought some more miners online um, or competition. The difficulty adjustment hasn't adjusted yet. And so blocks were also coming in faster. Like on that day, May 12th, blocks were coming in the average interval, eight minutes and 42 seconds, um, which is very fast considering the average target time is 10 minutes. Also, we had an instance where a block, block 788695, for those that want to look it up on mempool.space, had more fees than uh, the subsidy in the block reward. So the miner, um, when they mined that block, earned more coin from the amount of fees paid by transactors than the new supply that was issued on Bitcoin. So these are some major developments. That's the first time that that's happened since December 2017. There may have been another instance at some point when there was like a wallet failure and somebody accidentally spent a ton of their coins. But that these are these are sort of major things. Now, personally, do I think this is going to um, be something that persists a long time um, and like continues to do these things? Probably not, just because the same reason the off return protocols, uh, the struggles that they ran into, it's inefficient and it's cheaper to do elsewhere. Um, but for right now, we have meme coins on Bitcoin and they're paying a lot to miners and it's fun to watch. That's my thing. Well, what do you think? Yeah, it's miners, we love this. Yeah, so we have this chart up and for those listening, I'll just describe it. And for those watching, you get to watch me describe it. So the costs, the dollars per pen dash per day, which is a measurement of how much miners earn in revenue, skyrocketed earlier this week to around $130 per pen dash per day. Uh, this is the highest hash price that we've had since like August, 2022. Uh, so, you know, coming up on nine plus months, uh, just like parabolic growth in terms of hash price. And it was awesome to be online those two days. Now it's come back down to earth. We're getting close to where we at. Well, where we at before at like $72 per petash per day. Uh, but that period was awesome. And that was all because of ordinals and specifically BRC20 tokens. There was a BRC20 mint for a few different products. Uh, notably one called XEN that just drove up demand to use block space and led to like congestion issues. A lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of uh, transactions with lower SAS per byte transaction fees embedded in them were just being pruned directly from people's nodes. So they weren't even being included. Uh, so it was pretty great time to be mining Bitcoin. If you're trying to send a transaction on chain, a little bit tougher. There was a lot of conversations on Twitter from Bitcoin maximalists with, in my opinion, some kind of B-casher takes where they're like, hey, people are being priced out of using Bitcoin because of this. Same time though, it's like, this is a part of Bitcoin and Bitcoin is a open market for transaction fees. So people are going to be priced out. Can't set a standard rate. Um, so that was interesting. Say so one, I just want one word on this because it feels like there's always this conversation about the fee market and there's, there's always a counterpoint um, to say that the fee market is bad. Either when fees are too low and people say, oh, Bitcoin is not going to be sustainable because there's not going to be enough fees after there's 21 million Bitcoin and the block subsidies run out to basically subsidize Bitcoin mining in the future. On the other side of things, when, when fees are really high, Bitcoin is unusable. It's too expensive to send a transaction. Bitcoin's not sustainable. The real thing about this is that one... Bitcoin has, has proved several times that a healthy fee market is, is, a, is clearly possible, right? Like as we're seeing right now, fees have surpassed subsidies, even though subsidies are pretty high. Two, we don't know what a fee market is, uh, how many transaction fees are, are enough to sustain healthy um, support for the chain, right? For miners to continue. And three, transactions uh, can, can be expensive and layer two solutions are being built and um, people have options to send Bitcoin in other ways. Um, so I just want to throw that out there because I feel I've been seeing it a lot on Twitter and I feel like it's an important point. What do you think? It's time to address the FUD. I appreciate you doing that. Now, I don't have much more to take on what you were saying. Let's go back to the, the mining side of things. 
the thing that interested me, and this will actually segue us into the next topic, which is Marathon Digital, is some of these mining firms that are specifically mining uh, for themselves had their own mining pools were just reaping the reward. So Marathon Digital, you know, they they secured a lot of Bitcoin over this period. And uh, I forget the amount, but I think they mined like 45 plus Bitcoin more than they were supposed to over the period based on like their hash rate estimates. So some of these Bitcoin miners were able to earn a lot more revenue over this period, which is certainly going to be helpful given that some of these miners were in a pretty bad spot. Um, and if we continue to see like a high fee rate environment, like we are sort of right now, then I think miners can start to like think a little bit more optimistically about their operations. In terms of pools, I think Luxor pool was the one that netted the most Bitcoin during this period. Look at this beautiful block from Marathon. So here's the, these are probably inscriptions or not necessarily. They might just be like other Bitcoin transaction types, but some of these are probably inscriptions and they take up a large amount of data. Um, and they earned nine Bitcoin in this block between the subsidy and the fees. And then some of them, they earned like up to 11 Bitcoin. And then the one you mentioned, someone earned over 12 Bitcoin in one block, which is great for them. That's a lot of money. So I think it just kind of speaks to like, it's a good time to be mining Bitcoin because of ordinals and it will likely continue to be a larger part of the subsidy. Before this event, we were at like 2% of a block was transaction fees or 2% of rewards from mining was transaction fees, I should say. Yeah, I bet after ordinals, we get closer to like 5 to 10% in that range just going forward. That would be, I think, a, a fair estimate. Just to put the numbers in perspective, like the subsidy per block right now is six McCord coins. So if you got 12, you have double of what you would get just from issuance. So it's very significant. Very significant. That's all I got with that one. Okay, let's leave that one there. Plenty of ordinal talk to be had in the future, of course. Let's actually talk about Marathon Digital. Uh, we'll throw this headline up for you. Marathon Digital, two headlines this week. One, that they are moving forward with their uh, Abu Dhabi zero mining scheme. They're going to do immersion cooled Bitcoin mining in the country. I think they are working on a 250 megawatt plus site and they're going to be owning part of it and then uh, using immersion to mine there. Kind of speaks to them operating outside the US or mostly based in Texas and North Dakota at this time, uh, but they seem to be wanting to expand overseas. The second notice was from the SEC, which is now probing Marathon Digital. It's not quite clear what the probe is about. The last probe, the last subpoena from the SEC was over Harden, the Hardin Montana site, which Marathon Digital did extend uh, additional securities for, and then they left that site afterwards. So I believe it was something about perhaps being at the site, pulling out of the site, but issuing shares to cover the operations of that site. For, for the history books, the Hard to Montana site was purchased in 2020 to mine Bitcoin, but it was shut down because of basically ESG leveled concerns. They wanted to get out of that site because it was all coal. Um, so we'll see what happens with this. I, I think the biggest thing to me about the whole SEC probe is that anytime we see a crypto company with SEC, people jump to conclusions, but Marathon Digital is already publicly listed. So like I don't think there's really going to be that much that comes out of this. This isn't like Terra Luna. This isn't FTX. This is a completely different thing, but a lot of people put them in the same basket. Yeah, I, I, but it does cause the resources to like respond to these things, and it is probably a nuisance for for the company. Um, and there, it's pretty clear that there's a, a crackdown in the in the United States, so with enforcement actions, um, and kind of a, a closer eye on the industry at whole. Um, and there's also kind of bills that are going around to add additional taxes on miners. So I'm not surprised that Marathon is trying to kind of diversify geo geographically, geopolitically, where their sites are and where their mining operations are. That the fact they're doing a large scale immersion cooling is kind of interesting. It's not expensive, but we'll sort of monitor and see how that's going. They surely have, you know, one of the largest public listed miners have capital. But yeah, that's pretty much all my thoughts on that. It'll be interesting to follow that story and that ZC thinks if they go after others as well. Yeah, just a sidebar. Anthony Power just put out the late, latest April mining updates from all the public miners and Marathon Digital just continues to extend its winnings in 2023. 2022 was a really hard year for them uh, because of Compute North, mostly, uh, that firm going to Chapter 11. But since then, I think they have over 15x a hash online and they're meeting... They're like racing towards their goal of 23x hash online by mid-year, which is 
That's all hash rate. We're at about uh, about 330 exit hash. So 23 yeah. is a lot. There's a lot of hash rate. A lot of Bitcoin. Okay, last topic. Hut 8 is when it happens with problems. So in November, they got into a dispute with their power provider at one of their facilities. Validius was the power provider. And since then, they've been a stalemate. There's not been any mining operations on the site. The site should be running about one exa hash. Since then, HUD-8 has been operating about 2.5 exa hash, or maybe a little bit under that, um, and trying to like negotiate this power agreement with Blilius. It has seemingly gone nowhere, just sort of a standstill. All those units are offline. And then this last month in April, they should have a 15% capacity. Uh, the site was operating at 15% capacity due to electrical damages on equipment at the site. So it brought HUD's total uh, exahash down from 2.6 to 0.9 exahash, leading to less Bitcoin produced. Uh, this comes, of course, after HUT 8 is moving towards a merger with US Bitcoin um, and just like tougher environments to be mining up in Canada, seemingly. Uh, just like a sort of a tough story for them. So not dogpiling at all, but I think it just kind of shows you like when you have one thing go wrong, a second thing can go wrong and it can spiral out of control. So I hope that they get some of this stuff done. Luckily, their share price has not really been affected too much. And the mining stocks, do they really ever trade on like fundamentals? It's, it's kind of wild. Um, yeah. I mean, Hydro went crazy too. They didn't move. They went like down um, when yeah. miners were getting more good come. But yeah, uh, thanks for Hot Abe to miss out on the fee craze. Um, yeah, it's a story to monitor for sure, especially if it impacts their merger with US Bitcoin. Um, but there's no indication of that or anything. Um, but yeah, definitely something to keep an eye on. Yeah, the only reason we really brought up this story is because it was like a notable, notable percentage drop in hash rate online at the same time that all these inscription fees are going crazy. So it was a nice bump for some miners, right? Like we talked about Marathon, they earned like 50 Bitcoin plus uh, on the month just because they were in the right place at the right time. And HUD-8 had the wrong thing happen at the wrong time, and now they're having to suffer for it, and that hurts their books, that hurts your ability to aggressively scale. Uh, so definitely something to bring up, and that's part of mining Bitcoin. It's part of the game. Okay, last topic. I lied. We actually have one more. This is zero sync. We'll just mention it for a second. Uh, we like to keep everyone updated on like happenings in Bitcoin on the tech side as well. Uh, a new paper called Zero Sync, Introducing Validity Proofs to Bitcoin, was just published this week, ZeroSync, the first ever proof system addressing Bitcoin scalability challenges with succinct, non-interactive arguments of knowledge, aka SNARKs. ZeroSync compresses the entire Bitcoin blockchain to compact proof of validity, enabling instant verification and unlocking various innovative applications. The idea for this is like you might be able to add rollups on Bitcoin in the future, stuff like that. But for right now, it's like, hey, we can probably make it easier to run a Bitcoin node or do the initial block download using a, a snark. Um, so this could like help add more Bitcoin nodes to everywhere. Yeah, uh, this is cutting edge uh, like cryptographic research, which is awesome that like the um, Bitcoin and like gotta give a nod to um, Ethereum as well in this respect actually push that space forward, which is really uh, interesting. Like you said, this kind of lowers the burden of the onboarding process potentially in the future, right? And will, I guess, become more and more important as the the chain gets um, larger in size, right? Just as background, when you are uh, want to join the Bitcoin network and you, and you decide to become a full node um, and join as a, as a computer running the software, right? When you first come online, you connect to different peers and you ask for blocks and you begin what Will said the initial block download process where you go one by one and you verify with people to make sure that everything is correct um, and that you are on the the longest chain. Um, and this could s speed up that process significantly where instead of going block by block, um, you basically have a proof that consumes more than one block, right? And potentially a lot of blocks. Um, and so that process could go from days to seconds and minutes depending on um, how good this uh, the cryptography is here and how quickly you can verify things, what computer hardware you're using, etc. So really interesting thing to develop. Hells yeah, we love that. We'll keep up to date with that story, but from us at the Mining Pod, we're going to wrap it up here and let you get back to your weekend. Thanks for sticking with us. Matt, always a pleasure. 
We'll talk to you next week. Cheers.